Good afternoon. This is Andrew Sheets with the Third Heaven Traveler blog. The Third Heaven Traveler is about our spiritual life in Jesus Christ and him in us who believe on him and applying this existence to our physical world. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, King James Bible. The title of this study is The Seven Churches of Revelation. I'm speaking of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We read in Revelation chapter 1, 11, saying, and this is Jesus speaking, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Dear Lord, I submit this work to you for your glory, praying even so, come Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray and I mark all of those hyper-dispensationalists and those evil, evil reprobates, Lord, including all of the NAR who deny the book of Revelation, that these are the churches, that the true church of Philadelphia is included, and we are in prophecy. We are the bride, Lord. We're waiting for our redemption, Lord. All of those mockers, Lord, I mark them. They're judged in the name of Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Maranatha. The references for the timelines of churches of Revelation, I have uh, using and have used in this study Philip Scharf in his uh, outstanding work called The History of the Apostolic Church. Of course, Fox's Book of Martyrs. The uh, re reference C is the introduction to the history of Christianity, third edition. Reference D is the study of church history from C uh, Christian History Institute. I use some of the writings of Flavius Joseph, uh, Jose Josephus and the Antiquities of the Jews, book 20. And uh, book 20 is where I got a lot, but I, there's all of his in antiquities of the Jews uh, it is a quite extensive. Uh, and then also in Justin Martyr's first apology and dialogue with Trifo. In opening, I want to say this on page 390 of reference A, that's Philip Scharf's work, History of the Apostolic Church. We read that quote, he writes, we read the forbearance of God with his covenant people who had crucified their own savior at last reached its limits. As many as could be saved in the usual way were rescued. The people had, ostens had obstinately set themselves against all improvement. James the just, the man who was fitted, if it could be, to reconcile the Jews to the Christian religion, had been stoned by his hardened brethren, for whom he daily interceded in the temple, and with him the Christian community in Jerusalem had lost its importance in that city. On page 426 of Schaff, in reference A, confirms that Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna, and the Jews were handily involved in that. Now, why am I opening this up with this? I want to prove that in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, when these churches were listed, people, these were really churches. They, it, you can see the ruins even today in modern-day Turkey. False teachers, like this hyper-dispensationalist, the reprobate going straight to hell, the evil man, this despicable calling himself a pastor, and Rodney Bellow, and in his Grace Church or whatever, they're so lost, they're universalist. But he and others, now, it's there's a lot of teachers, and it's all in my studies and the links here. They actually teach that the book of Revelation has nothing to do with the church. 
and that these churches in Revelation are not even really have nothing to do with church. And I, I know for most of my subscribers that you're, I know this is shocking, but even though it says churches, they say, well, it doesn't really mean churches. People, it does. And, and this is just one example of hundreds where the names and places that's written in Revelation, is back, it's backed up by historical archaeological evidence. So if someone tells you that 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 these churches really aren't churches that they're it's just allegory and it's all for Israel the entire book of revelation tell them that they're going straight to hell because that's where they're going because for them to be that blind and lost means they have no idea who Jesus Christ is so we are to mark them mark them as heretics now, some of the examples and the links I ask you in the description box, you have the blog. These are just, this is just the tip of the iceberg, people. These are some of the false teachers. They're hyper dispensationalists. They're all in the same, same group in the Laodicean church that I'm going to discuss later down here. Uh, for example, uh, the Yoke Masters Part 3. This is this Rodney Bellow at Grace Bible Church. Read this link, and I have also this Justin Johnson. That boy, he's got some kinks. Serious now, the he does. Justin does some good stuff about delineating the kingdom dispensation of the kingdom gospel, uh, comparing it to the gospel of grace. But then he falls off the cliff. Also, is that Sherwood guy? Uh, from uh, Richard, uh, he is Richard uh, something from Sherwood Bible Church or whatever he's in there. Now, also study the hyper dispensationalists. Who are these people? They remove prophecy for the church people. They're all over the place. They'll come at you as really dedicated, God fearing, loving Jesus all day long, but they do not understand the mystery. And it's all in my links in here. The Laodicean church people, they don't understand the mysteries given to Paul. And also study the little flock comes to the church. you got these hyper dispensationalists. They honestly believe Peter was under the law the whole time, not even in grace. Not even, he's, they believe that the Jews, including the apostles, except for Paul, were in a totally different salvation program. Study the Shachanah of Paul in the book of Hebrews. Understand the Revelation 12 sign. This all is connected, people. And how, in reproving Dr. Andy Woods and this Dustin, they are so lost. Know what a true Jew is because they, they have it all backwards. It's all in here. Now, as I, I told you, the references I'm using here, uh, references A through F, Let's go through the introduction here. In accordance with the above references, A through F, the historical evidence provides a preponderance of evidence that the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, are chronographically historical as well as spiritually literal. What does that mean? Stay with me and you'll find out. As delineated below, we will see each church is well-defined as a figurative representation that is also historically recorded and solidly bolstered by biblical record. The evidence of the churches of Revelation as both historical and biblical spiritual examples of the progressing church age people, it begins with Ephesus in the book of Revelation. We see in, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, as it begins with the church of Ephesus being what? The first example here. And we know that this is not, not a literal church. It has spiritual significance backed with scripture, and for false teachers to teach that this is not a, a literal, this is not just allegory, 
is preposterous. You know, people don't study their Bible. They don't do any research. They sit with these false teachers. I see this all the time, and that's the mark of the Laodicean church. That's part of the doctrine of Balaam, part of the, the, the Nicolaitans. They are under bondage by false teachers, and they're blind. They don't study their Bible. That's why we're at the end of this age. We see this progression from the apostolic age, beginning with Ephesus, where there are major problems identified by scriptures. Uh, namely, let's go with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 32. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 32, and look in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 32, we see the application that there's a problem going on with the church of Ephesus, right, in the Ephesians. Paul even addresses it with Timothy. We see this again, and you may make notes of this, please. I'm not going to read. This would be too long of a video to go through each and every scripture, read them out and study those with you. Read them for yourself. That's your homework. Uh, look at Acts chapter 19, verses 23 through 41. Then go to Daniel chapter 7, culminating with Daniel 7, 13, Revelation chapter 1, 7. Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 12, 5, Psalm chapter 2, and finally uh, Psalm chapter 110. And uh, this is just a sample comparing this to the overcomer's crown. So what we see here is problems identified with the church in Ephesus. And we compare this to the overcomer's crown, and our battle continues to be thoroughly understood as we see the spiritual battle in Ephesians chapter 6. And, uh, you know, that's the two. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 is at 12 through uh, 18 or 20, spiritual warfare. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 2 through 5. The battle was since the day when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven at Pentecost and following, it never stopped people. The enemy has tried over and over, and you're going to see it here, to destroy the church. The devil hates the church with a passion. I don't want to get ahead of myself, so let's continue. So in the book of Revelation, we see here, we see Ephesus and Smyrna, as I read them, and Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, in accordance with scripture delineated below and the historical evidence that I pointed out in references A through F above, we're able to distinguish a definite pattern of events and time as follows, okay? Make your notes. You can stop the video here. Number one, we see the apostolic church, of course, beginning in 30 AD, 30 to 33 AD, after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all the way down, all the way proceeds to the death of John, the apostle John. So we're looking at a time frame, 30 to 33 AD, and historians generally uh, put this as 30 AD to 100 AD because that's when the Apostle John died. This begins with Ephesus. And so see Ephesus below. I'll go through each one below. This is just I'm giving you all seven here. Now, the next era in time, and this is very interesting. It's uncanny, actually. You can actually break this down from the first century church all the way to the second century. And this is what the historians call the martyr church and compare it to Smyrna. Now, below, you'll see these are actual historical inc incidents where in Smyrna, they struggled with Jews terribly. The Jews are bad people against they hate 
the Christian church with a passion. Now, I just saw a recent thing. It's in my video posted where it's now anti-Semitic to say that G the Jews were responsible for killing Jesus Christ. That's anti-Semitic now. But the truth is they were. And Smyrna, Revel look at for yourself. If you go to Revelation chapter 2-9, you'll see that Smyrna is struggling with Jews and also Jesus marks those who say they're Jews, but they're not. These are the fake Jews. Uh, this definitely, there's historical evidence where Polycarp was martyred by killed, and the Jews were very much involved in this, and you'll see it in the study. Again, why am I going through this? Because the churches and revelation are really real. Incidents happened in history, and Scripture talks about it. These are not allegorical, just does not do with the church, people. It does have to do with the church. The next, the third church, Pergamos, that references the compromising church. This is from the second century to the third century. Now, I want to say something here. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Something amazing happened. Before the last apostle disciple, John, before he died, we know that all of the apostles, Paul and John and Peter, and, and all of them were warning that the wolves are coming. The false teachers are on their way. <coughs> Excuse me, John was saying that the, that the spirit of the Antichrist was already at work. They knew what was at the door. They knew as soon as all of them had, had, were, had passed that there was going to be an onslaught of false teachers to come into the church. Jesus Christ warned, and sure enough, in the second century, a man by the name of Tert Tertu Tertullian, it's all in my Godhead versus Trinity studies, came up with this stoic philosophical concept of the Trinity. It has n it's not doctrine, people. And that, for nearly, what? Lord, it's hard to imagine for nearly 2,000 years it's finally ingrained itself in the mainstream Christianity. This is where I'm going with this. The compromising, see, the church suffered mightily under the Roman emperors. You're going to see all that in the first to second century. Then the, in the third century, correction, I'm sorry, from the second to third century, they're still being persecuted mightily by the Roman emperors and slaughtered left and right. But guess what? The Trinity is now enter entered and it's now building and gaining traction in the second century. The, in Pergamos, see Pergamos about the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I have it in here. It's in scripture and we'll see that. Next, as we proceed, we come to the church of Thyatira. This people is the Roman Catholic Church. This is the Vatican. This is the papal persecutions in the third century. Now, from the third century all the way up to the 15th century, can you believe that? 12 centuries, over a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church persecuted horrifically, and we're going to see all this. And Thyatria means ruled by a woman. And well, guess what? That's the Queen of Heaven, the Jezebel connection to idol worship, okay? Then that's in the 15th, up to the 15th century. Then from the 15th century to the 1700s, right? This is Sardis. Sardis is the false Reformation church. See below Sardis. They, their works were not perfect. They were almost like Philadelphia. They really didn't have a lot against them, but their works were not perfect. This was what I call the fake Protestant movement. When the wolves, again, the wolves among the sheep, namely Martin Luther, you know, you're, I heard from day one, oh, the great Martin Luther, he's the father of the Ref great reformation. He's the one that came, the former Catholic priest that became a Protestant. No, people. 
And then there's John Wycliffe. Oh, the great John Wycliffe. Oh, the martyr. Okay. Or, or he was almost a martyr. He, he was hated by the Vatican. No, no. He, they're both Catholic priest people. They were wearing Protestant clothing. Make no mistake. The Lutherans were Catholics dressed in Protestant clothing. Ask yourself this question. Why did Martin Luther and John Wycliffe, why were they never burned at the stake? They were never martyred, as was William Tyndale. I'll leave it at that. The next uh, step, coming from the 1700s, and this will be from the 1700s all the way to the day we're raptured, this is the true church, the revival church, the true Reformation church. I call this the Church of Philadelphia. I call this the true church. This happened in the 1700s. We saw a great revival happening, but more so, we see the separatist, the separatist movement. And study this for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. I want people to study this. The separatist movement, when you research that, you're going to find that the Puritans, the pilgrims, the dissenters, they break away from the corrupted Church of England. Now, by then, the Church of England had been totally infiltrated by the Vatican. The move and migration to America was huge. There was a true break away. Now, we're going to see, and there's a really powerful video about how the Vatican eventually, the crown jewel of the Vatican, man, they wanted America. They always wanted England. They finally broke England down and infiltrated the Church of England. They always, always have wanted the United States, and they came in with waves and waves. When the Irish immigrants were coming in, they brought with them Catholicism. But all of these movements were the revival and the true Reformation church people that was supposed to happen by the Martin Luther's and John Wycliffe's. That was a joke. This separatist movement, these dissenters, they break away from the corrupted Church of England and they migrate to America. Uh, if you're interested, study these links. I, th I was fascinated. I thought I knew a little bit about them, but it was a lot more than I thought. Now, although England had withstood the onslaught of the Vatican for centuries, eventually the Leviathan conquered and infiltrated. And it's no coincidence that the King James Bible was published in 1611. And it's all in my links below in the Philadelphia study, okay? Now, I need to stop here. It's no coincidence that on December the 5th, 2001, I stopped drinking after life, years and years of my life of alcoholism. That's when I committed my life to Jesus Christ. On December the 5th, 2005, I received the commission by the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him in mission work. And then later, in De on December the 5th, 2012, I was standing in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. I had just traveled over 10,000 miles across the halfway around the world. I was sent here to attend a meeting, and I, someone else paid for it and everything. And this was a meaningless, worthless four-hour meeting. And I walked out of the meeting, and I was in downtown Philadelphia there, down in the city square, known as City Hall there, right in front of the William Penn building. And I was like, what am I doing here? What in the world were these people thinking of? Why would they bring me here for this worthless meeting? It was at that moment. I would found myself standing in front of a banner. It looked like it, it, my memory served me. It, I just did. I was taken back. It looked like heralding angels, angels shouting hallelujah. And at that moment, the Lord made it clear that my calling was related to the entire purpose of the church of Philadelphia, if that makes sense, people. I knew even then, back then, I knew clearly that Philadelphia was the true church. And it was there that the Lord gave me not an audible voice. I didn't talk to Jesus personally standing there, but the thought came so clear. Look up, look at that sign. 
Your, our redemption draws nigh. Look at the rapture, the soon coming rapture. The Church of Philadelphia will be raptured. Now, this is incredible. While preparing this blog, I revisited the initial blog I did on Philadelphia. Back in 2012, I went and dug that old blog out. And I was shocked when I realized that the banner that I thought was like some angels, it looked like, I just remember it's angels. When I looked at it carefully, because I'd taken a picture of it, it was really ballet dancers, two ballerinas who looked like just these magnificent angels. Now, I understand. Listen, I understand. Angels are men. We don't have any historical, we have no scripture evidence that angels are, are women. And when I saw that, I don't remember them being ballerinas. I really don't. But when I went back and visited the picture, there were two ballerinas. And guess what? The banner was an announcement for Nutcracker, right? So I looked at the significance of the Nutcracker. And it just says Nutcrack, to crack the nut on the banner. And I said, what's the significance of this in the Hebrew? And I refers, I dropped, my jaw dropped. I had no idea, but it refers directly to Isaiah chapter 11, 1. Isaiah 11, 1 reads, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. People, this is the type and shadow of the mystery. It's in my links here. This is the true mystery Jesus Christ gave to Paul. This means that as Abraham, it was counted to him righteous. He did nothing to get to earn that it was a simple, unilateral decision on the part of God finding Abraham righteous by grace. It's faith through grace, people. And it's, it, this is the whole gospel of grace and that our salvation is by belief alone. Nothing else added to that. Now, if you get, oh yeah, open the link the personal re revelation of the church of philadelphia read that in there it's really a moving testimony it shows this whole story in here you know in fact let me go there i want to show share something this is when the whole church of philadelphia was given to me i'd walked out of the meeting hall I was in this very exclusive posh gentleman's club downtown there in this conference it was a old very well dec highly decored opulent ambiance and i was in this office uh, in this uh, conference area i walked out and i saw what i just all i could remember now i might remember i'm going back 12 years and i just snapped a picture with my phone this is, the, this is the city hall here in downtown Philadelphia. And I looked up and it looked like angels with stars or something. And I just, that's when the Lord just told me that my mission would be the Church of Philadelphia. This is my passion, teaching the, the Church of Philadelphia, if you will. And all that goes with that. So anyway, I thought that was heralding angels. And, and of course, I said, this is a sign of the rapture and everything. Praise God, the church. I knew that. But today, when I was going back into the study, I was astounded. And I read it. I said, wait a minute. I didn't even notice at the time. This was advertising the nutcracker. This was, as you know, in December. As I said, this was December the 5th. 20, 2012, and uh, this is getting ready for the Christmas season. Now, I, the Lord gave me the unction. I had the spiritual unction to say, what is nut? It says nut crack. What is nut cracker? And is that in Hebrew? And I wanted to know what the strongs for that was. And it sure enough, I was, I was shocked. It's net, sir, for nut cracker. And it literally, literally means and it comes to be Isaiah chapter 11, 1. It means a branch. 
the scripture given is, uh, is Isaiah 11, 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is the mystery. This is the church grafted in. We are in Christ through this branch. We're the branch that's grafted in. It's all in my studies. It's all in Galatians chapter 6, 16, Galatians 4, 26, Romans chapter 4, 17, and, and Ephesians and, uh, chapter 2 and 3. And uh, I have these scriptures memorized. And if we look at uh, Romans chapter 16, and it's in the studies, people. This is the this is the mystery. Now, the ancient Hebrew lexicon two four two nine means a branch to watch over to guard as a watchman, and this is why I in twelve years later this has been revealed to me from March twenty twenty nine. Today is March twenty nine twenty twenty four. The original post was done in twenty two thousand twelve. It's twelve years. We know the number twelve is government. And sure enough, I took that photo on December the 5th, 2012, okay? And right in front of the William Penn City Hall, this is, he's the founder, the first governor of the colony of Pennsylvania on top of it. And it was going back in time, December the 5th, 2001, Jesus delivered me out of alcohol, alcoholism by miraculous intervention. I spent the time going through a time of purification and learning my master's way and not my own. It was on December the 5th, 2005. The Holy Spirit moved on me in the most powerful way while I was at a resort. And that's when I knew my life would never be the same. And I was called to go to Vietnam, leaving everything. And ultimately, for almost seven years later, I came back to the United States, never thought it would. But it was while I was in Vietnam, I was called by some folks who really wanted me to come to originally New York City, and that fell through. So they said, we're going to, they're going to have a rental car to take you to uh, Philadelphia. And that's when I understood that the Lord had me there. No coincidence to reveal to me Jesus Christ, uh, to see the rapture and that I would, the saints would be going home and the rapture and Philadelphia represents the rapture, the true church. But the Holy Spirit also revealed to me and that, that Revelation chapter 3, 7 through 12, it's directly related to the church. This is what I'm talking about, the bride of Christ. And when I went back and looked at this whole thing, I was like, wait a minute. I took that picture in Philadelphia. The day before, or actually the evening before, I should say, I was in New York City because I'd been to New York City a couple, three times. I remember the, the, tr the two trade centers, World Trade Centers, before 9-11. But I'd never seen, post 9-11, I'd never seen the new One World Trade Center. 1,776 feet tall, where's your 1776, your 666, illuminate, all the Illuminati stuff, build back better. And here, the Lord told me, not audibly, not Jesus standing there talking to me, but the thought, powerful thought came to me, I want you to see man's, the representing the beast system, the Antichrist, and then the revelation of of the true Philadelphia church, we're going to be rescued. We're out of here. It was at that moment I had an epiphany when I was in Philadelphia. But then when I went back over this, I had the real big epiphany of that worthless four hour meeting had a divine reason behind the whole thing. To show me that the new world order's power displayed in the one true world trade center was a one world government. The Antichrist was coming in the Church of Philadelphia gave me the promise of the rapture. Okay, that's what I'm getting with all this. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing. I urge you to go back and read all this. Also, there's quite significant here that look at the fives. December the 5th, December the 5th, December the 5th. Five is significant. It shows uh, grace. It's a sign of the rapture. It was confirmed. I was, it was so strong 
that I knew that I would have something to do with the Church of Philadelphia. So when I'm doing this, people, and there's another whole study on the Church of Philadelphia. Anyway, it's in the links. I, I, I can't tell you. I, I just can't tell you strong enough how this entire, the book of Revelation, how entirely the churches involved here are significant. Enough of that. Now, the reference C, the references I went through, they listed as, again, I'm telling you, many sources, they break it down first century, second, a little bit different than what I have from my studies, but basically we see these time frames breaking and what's happening to the church. Again, the seven churches of Revelation are real churches in Asia Minor during the first century people. Each message is addressed to a particular spiritual condition of the church, urging believers, as I already told you, to, over, other, to overcome challenges, to grow in faith and love. Let's begin Ephesus. We know Ephesus, a Greek city in Asia Minor, right? Current day Turkey people. It was the worship center of Artemis. It was Latinized form of the Greek Ephesos, uh, Eph, Ephesos, traditionally derived from Ephoros or overseer in reference to the religious significance, but it might be folk etymology. They write here, okay, Ephesine, okay. Now, Ephesus, this ancient city in uh, modern day Turkey, it's an important uh, commercial and cultural center. It had a magnificent temple, as we know, to the goddess Artemis. Now, Paul visited Ephesus during his second missionary journey and spent two years there. And it was during this time he established a Christian community and wrote a letter to the Ephesians, which is now part of the New Testament. Now, the church of Ephesus, although it was founded by Paul, the Apostle Paul, during his missionary journey in Asia Minor in AD 52, it was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, and of the largest cities, right? And it played a major significant role in the spread of Christianity in the region. And it's considered, as I said, one of the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, more facts on it, read it for yourself. I just want to highlight on some of the main points. But we see in the Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7, this is the church of the loveless. Jesus is telling them they lost their first love and to remember their first love. That's the spiritual theme, is, or, or that's the message. And the historical theme is persecution and suffering, endurance and faithfulness. Now, regarding Ephesus losing their first love and their renewal for love for God, I'll let you read the studies on that. That's not my purpose to go through this. What I want to bring out in my study is I told you that Paul mentions Ephesus at least two times being difficult, troublesome, and even calling them beasts at Ephesus. Now, I'm really upset by this, but there, there is significant, ridiculous, insane commentary that using unimaginable stretches of vain imagination. They're saying that when Paul caused the beast at Ephesus, he was referring to a literal wild beast in an arena that he supposedly was thrown into. And he's saying, hey, it's all exaggerated. People, that's ridiculous. When we apply sound hermeneutics to 1 Corinthians 15, 32, we see the context applied to Acts chapter 19, 23 through 41. And I already read those other verses to you. That, that that Paul was referring to the church there at Ephesus. And when we see using good exegesis in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, we see the conjunction at. This isn't the city of Ephesus. This is not a general location, but a specific, very at, identifying specifically a group of people. When we apply the final step of third step of hermeneutics, which is uh, harmonizing scripture, we see clearly in 1 Corinthians 50, 15, 32, we just go to 2 Timothy chapter 6, 9, and 10. We go to Revelation chapter 2, 4. 
Look at the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. These people were a very big problem because the thorns and the cares of this world and the wealth and all of the other thing had choked out their faith, was choking out their faith, enough said. Again, this is not, I'm not here to do an archaeological, anthropological study in depth. I know I'm going to go through every church and, and we're going to do a, a, write our thesis on this or do some doctrinal thesis. Uh, it is simply to show you that the book of Revelation, the churches are really there and it has significance. What does that have for us today? Well, I'll leave it at that. Smyrna. Greek word means that. Read it for yourself. Now, all of these came from very deep pagan gods, and the Romans adopted their own gods into the Greek gods and all this. And here are these churches here. Interesting, isn't it? In Smyrna, we call we see in Revelation chapter 2, 8 through 11, this is the church of suffering, being faithful unto death. Here we go. The execution and martyrdom of Polycarp. Uh, Polycarp. He was, you could check this for yourself, the bishop at Smyrna, the hands of the Jews. Notice the language here in reference D on Polycarp and the Jews. It says it was all done at the time, takes to tell, the crowd collected wood and bundles of sticks from shops and public baths. The Jews, as usual, were keen to help. What they were so like in a frenzy, just like when they murdered Stephan, just like in the frenzy, the bloodlust when they crucified Jesus Christ and all the disciples, except for John. They can't wait. I, we're going to burn him. Uh, get wood. Uh, we're going to get it. Let's burn him. It's recorded, people. The historical theme of Smyrna is persecution and suffering. The spiritual theme is endurance and faithfulness. That's our, we see that, and we see that in history. I can't also, I just can't stress, we're going to see more, but you can do the research yourself through uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and Josephus goes into depth on it, uh, Justin the Martyr goes into it, but there, the persecution and suffering by Nero, and even in Augustus, and, and it, the, the Christians were suffering terribly under this persecution people. Next, Pergamos. Pergamos, known as Pergamum and Pergamos, ancient Greek city in Maesia, northwest Turkey, major intellectual and cultural center during the Hellenistic, the Hellenistic period. Pergamos, the first mentioned literary source, Anabas composed, da, 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 whatever. Their background here is the church of compromising. They're told to repent and overcome. This is the church that Jesus accused him of the doctrine of Balaam, introducing greed, money, to basically pimping out for God, making money off God. The pursuit of unrighteous gain, leading others into sin. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, those that bring the people into bondage by false doctrine. Now, I have excerpts here of my doctrine. It's I did a deep study on what is doctrine. And also, I have a whole thing on Balaam and the Nicolaitans. I'm not going to read that now, but it is shocking. Please read that. We're going to talk about how this ties in and connects later with the Laodicean church, and I will read some more of that right now. But for now, read my links on Jesus and I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. On what is doctrine? Know what doctrine is, people. Read the whole study on that. The historical theme here when we're talking about Pergamos is that they were into compromise and worldliness. Their spiritual theme is to repent and to separate themselves, come out of it. Now, when we're talking about Pergamos here, uh, this goes in, as I was telling you, up to the third century, and Constantine is going to come into play here because supposedly he converted to Christianity 
And uh, I'm going to talk about that here. But when we come into Pergamos, we're si- everything is being set up for Thyateria. When we get to Thyateria, now, as I showed you here, uh, back in the beginning here, we're now into, as church history progresses here, let me go back up here again. I can't, excuse me, I can't remember the exact time frame. But when we get to Thyatria, yes, the 3rd century all the way to the 15th century. By the time we get to the 3rd century, we're now in the Queen of Heaven. The Catholic Church is in full force. Tertullian's Stoic philosophical concept of Trinity is now entrenched as doctrine of the Catholic Church. Thyateria was originally called Pelopia and Samarimus before it was renamed to Thyateria during the Hellenistic era, about 290 by King Seculus I Nectar. Selectus. The name Thyatria literally comes from the Greek word meaning daughter. Also have other studies that shows of a woman ruled by a woman. Makes sense because uh, we see later that's the queen of heaven. And Thyatria gained fame for dying fa- for its dying facilities and became the center for purple cloth trade. Think of what? All of the mystery babble on the harlot, clothed in purple, and uh, want to just and in scarlet. Let's look at that really quick. I want to make sure that purple in uh, this is all referring. It connects back from Romans uh, correction, Revelation chapter seventeen, uh, fourteen. Revelation chapter fourteen connects back. Now this is the mystery Babylon. This is what connects back in here. And then if you look back, uh, please open your Bibles. Uh, thank you. This is just a little time out to go back and check this. When we see that mystery Babylon, and this is all connected to the harlot and Romans, uh, I always want to say Romans. I'm so sorry. Revelation chapter uh, okay, 18, se- okay, it is it is 17, sorry, 15, 14 through 17. And go to Revelation chapter 17, 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, this woman represents Mystery Babylon. And if you go back to uh, Re- Revelation chapter 17, 5, on forehead was written, Mystery, Babylon, the great mother of the harlots, abominations of the earth. And go back to verse 4, 17, 4, and the woman was arrayed in purple. So in purple, and it, that's what I was trying to think. I said, wait a minute, it's purple and scarlet, right? Or is it just purple? No, it's purple and scarlet. So you see the connection there. Again, Thyatria represents the Vatican people. Mystery Babylon, by the way, it's not America. Mystery Babylon is the entire world system. Rome, the harlot, is the religious system. The economic system is all comes through the major banks, the Luciferians through London, military power through Washington, all that. It's all my studies is the military power from Washington. This whole beast system is elaborate. It's very intricate, but it really breaks down to religion, politics, military might, right, and and money, wealth. Off the subject here. Now, the historical background of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, 18 through 29, this church is corrupt. This is corrupt. It's tolerant of false teaching. It's, it, it is corrupt in discernment, and it's corrupt in its faithfulness to the truth. Now, everything points to the Catholic Church really being founded in 590 uh, AD. But let's be honest. I and other scholars believe that the Catholic Church really started with the Council of Nicaea. This is Constantine in 325. That's when the Trinity came in as official doctrine of the church. This is ecumenism. 
This is when Christian Christendom came into being to resolve the disputes of the church and adopt the teachings of Arius and threaten it. It basically this is when after Constantine, what a fake, what a joke was converted to Christianity. No, whatever. But he just looked at it as another religion. This is when Satan realized that all of the centuries of persecution, horrific persecution by Rome was not going to get it. By the Jews was not going to get it. It had to be the church himself. If you can't beat him, Satan was like, hey, if I can't beat him, I'll join him. So this is when Satan forms religion, not pagan religions, but a so-called fake false, complete, corrupt, another Christ, the spirit of the Antichrist. This was when, and I believe that the Pope will either be the Antichrist, or, but I think more likely he will be the false prophet when the Antichrist comes on the scene here soon before, well, after we're soon out of here. So Roman Catholicism really began officially, it was 590, but in 325 after the Council of Nicaea, Read it, study the Council of Nicaea. Now, uh, I have in here the pagan Roman Empire supposedly found Christ, right? Started his new religion. Again, this is ecumenism. He adopted the Trinity from Tertullian, the Greek Stoic philosophers. Please read my extensive studies on the Trinity, how pagan, it's pagan polytheism. Now, the Church of Thyatira here, again, ruled by a woman, which is pre perfect because this is the area ro ruled by the mother church of papal Rome, the great harlot revelation, as I already talked about. See my extensive studies on the queen of heaven, the virgin. Uh, this is uh, la reina de los cielos, as they call her. And this is when the queen titles of Mary, the mother of Jesus. But read Jeremiah 44, 15 through 30. This is what God thinks of the queen of heaven right here. Burn incense to the queen of heaven, pour drink out. See, the queen of heaven is nothing new. This goes back to the Babylonians. It goes back all the way back to Nimrod. Nothing new here. And then in Jeremiah, it says here, uh, writes in, uh, that in verse 20, this is a Jeremiah chapter 44. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 44, 15 through 30. Read that for yourself, what God thinks of the queen of heaven. Yeah. You burn incense to the queen. Sounds familiar. Pour out drink offerings. Make cakes to worship her. And the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil doings, because of the abominations. This is an abomination, people. Yeah. Lord God said, saying that when the judgment came, God said, enough is, a, enough, is enough. I will watch over them for evil and not for good. It shall be a sign to you, saith the Lord, I will punish you in this place that you may know that my word shall surely stand against you for evil. This was all because of their worship of the Queen of Heaven people. Now, the, in the excerpt I have in here from what, the reference here from the seven churches of Revelation here, again, talking about Thyatira, this is the Antichrist beast popes, the Antichrist beast popes who lead the harlot Roman Catholic Church. There's overwhelming evidence that Thyatira was when the Catholic Church came to being people. Now, the terrible suffering that happened from 3 AD all the way up to the 1500s plus by the Catholic Church is unimaginable. Do the research, people. Read about the Waldensians and Peter Waldo, the Albigensians, the Hussets. Now, John Wycliffe, let me tell you, I said it earlier, I'm reading what some scholar wrote. John Wycliffe was not he was a fake. This is, he suffered by the hands of the Catholic Church because he called them out. He called them out for transubstantiation. He says, hey, we'll see that, purgatory, other things. But he was a closet Jesuit. He 
got the Protestants, identified the Protestants, and then sold in tons of false leaven after. As I said before, why wasn't John Wycliffe martyred? There was no question what happened to William Dendale. Also, John Wycliffe's tra English translation is, and I have it in my study. Please email me if you want more information on him. People, don't fall into the trap of the Wycliffe Bible. It's a mess. All that based on these, uh, not, he bases his translation and the Latin Vulgate, and it has holes all over it, based on the corrupted codexes, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Read my links. I'm not going to do it here. Now, the Roman Empire, it collapsed. Satan knew now he has no more emperors to persecute the church, so now he caused the Antichrist beast popes. And, and this, this scholar here believes that the popes will be Antichrist. All, all the other churches did believe that. He calls them to be given. He, they now have tremendous religious and civil power. And Emperor Justinian issued a decree making the Pope the head of all the churches. Here's what I've written. This is from me. Strongly recommend that you read the Waldensian's History by J.A. Wiley. Here's the link. I bought the book. It's in my personal library. I couldn't put it down the first time I read it. I literally wept. It is heartbreaking. I've read it a couple times. It's shocking what they went through. There, the Waldens went through in the Albigenses. Also, watch this video. It's a two-hour video or three-hour video called Lamp in the Dark, how mightily the Catholic Church tried to destroy the King James Bible and Christians. And they persecuted him for that. And then tears among the wheat. Watch that video. This will give you a real strong understanding of how wicked the Vatican is and why they're mentioned in the book. Of Revelation is one of the churches. Now, again, the Church of Thyatira was not a Catholic church in the first century. Let me make that clear. I'm saying the first century church, because of their acceptance with apostasy and heretical doctrine, and again, remember the key words here. The key words here. Let me go back to this right here. The key words, they were tolerant of false teachings, discernment, and faithfulness to truth. They were the corrupted church. The real church of Thyatira back that time had struggled with this. This is the actual church back in the first century. A, a correction, in the first century, the allegorical spiritual relevance happened when the Catholic Church came into being. It, I hope that's clear. Please email me if you have questions. Now, let's talk about Sardis. According to Herodotus, Herodias here, uh, Lydia was established by Lydus, the son of Attis, and uh, was given uh, to the uh, Herlock, Heroclidae and was held for 505 years. The last king, it goes on and on. It gives you all the background. The Persians held it till the conquest of Alexander the Great. So again, all, all of this you can read for yourself. This proves there was a church there named on that site of Sardis. Now, after 10 centuries of persecution from the Vatican, the Protestant church was dead, and it's only a very small remnant remained. When we're looking at Sardis, <clears throat> we see that there's a very, very small remnant. They're now, like, shot. The spiritual historical theme is there a spiritual deadness and the spiritual theme is faithful obedience they had held on this church represents after all of the persecution they'd held on but they're like they're, they're that's it now the word sardis means the escaping one and are those that came out so it's an excellent symbol of the church during the reformation period now they cite that martin luther and the number of other reformers they protested against the false teaching tyranny and claims of the papal church, which is the Vatican. Be careful here. As I point out, Martin Luther and John Wycliffe were, me, were fakes to me uh, from my research on them. But I will say that the church in Sardis, they faced 
the Antichrist beast popes. They faced a, a, the, 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 the suffering. And the, the Messiah saints during this area, like I said, were the Waldensians, Albigensians. But the main and the main events during this was, again, the papal persecution of the church. Uh, you can read all this for yourself. Now comes the Church of Philadelphia, the founding of the ancient city of Philadelphia. I think it's interesting that the city of Philadelphia was named, founded in the region of Lydia, which is now Eastern Turkey, uh, in honor of the beloved brother. That what Philadelphia comes, we get brotherly love. The city was located 70 miles from the Greek city of Smyrna. The Church of Philadelphia, please read my links and study here. The Church of Philadelphia will be raptured, receive crowns, and reign with Christ. That was revealed to me 12 years ago, and I believe that with all my heart. I urge you to open up the study, and it's in the link here on the, pers my, the personal revelation of the Church of Philadelphia. I'll make sure it's highlighted here in the link. I already read it above. More than any other church in the history of the churches, the Church of Philadelphia gives us the perfect type and shadow of the true church in the last days of this age that we await our rapture and reigning with Christ. This spiritually applies to all the true saints, going all the way back to Pentecost to believe on Jesus Christ as their Savior, that he died on the cross for their sins. We all believe that, right? He was buried and rose again on the third day, according to scriptures. Now, contrary to hyper-dispensationalists, as I said earlier, who claim Peter and the apostles, other than Paul, were not saved by grace, but through works of the law, guess what? Warning to them. Peter warns in his epistle in 2 Peter chapter 3.16. He writes, also in all epistles, speaking to them, in all of his epistles, Peter is talking about Paul. You can read it in verse 15 for yourself. Speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they are that are unlearned and unstable rest. It means they wrestle. So unstable folks and those that are unlearned will wrestle with Paul's teachings. Uh, but it says that they do with other scriptures too. But guess what? If Peter's saying, if you avoid the Pauline epistles, you're doing so to your own destruction. That is scary, people. Let's read Revelation 3, 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Man, this gives us hope and standing and endurance, people. In Revelation chapter 4, 1, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. This is the rapture, people. And first, the, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking to me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And in Colossians chapter four, three, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Please read this study. The Church of Laodicea does not know the mystery given to Paul from Jesus' people. Open the link there. Please read this study, the Church of Laodicea versus the Church of Philadelphia people. I had about five years ago, 30, 40 some links of the horrors in the apostate church today. I mean, things you can't imagine. This is from mainstream news reporting on churches and just other websites or other watchmen calling them out. In less than three years, I went from 
a few to hundreds. And now before Google pulled the, the blog down on me exposing these churches of Laodicea, which Google pulled down for hate speech. All I did is just posting what they're saying is that this is, uh, these people are in great sin. It's wrong. It went over a thousand plus, plus, plus. Please read that. Email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, we see in Acts 14, 27, and when they were come, they gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and he, how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. People, this is the church of Philadelphia. This is the remnant that came out, not the Jewish remnant. I'm talking about the Gentiles brought in, grafted in. To the wild as a wild branch into the olive tree, we are we inherit the promises given to Abraham. Amen. I we read uh, Revelation three ten. Well, no, I'm sorry. I read Revelation three eight. Let's read three ten. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, I urge you, please read my Revelation chapter 1, 9 study. Know what that means when we know that the patience of Jesus Christ, we have to understand that. We have to know why Paul is calling us his brother and companion tribulation. Not the seven, <clears throat> not the seven-year tribulation people. No. This is suffering now. And when the kingdom is the kingdom, millennial kingdom of God, which we will inherit, hyperdism say, I just don't believe that. And what does it mean, the patience of Jesus Christ? You know what that means? The suffering of Jesus Christ. We're in his suffering. He does the suffering. We abide in that by faith. It's all my study. Here's an interesting quote. From the references I have above, it says, John confirms that Jesus is holy and true, holy to the description of God. Isaiah, in various places, describes the holiness of God as his own attribute. Jesus himself says unashamedly, I am the truth, yet only God is all truth. He holds the key of David and open and shuts as he wills with no opposition. The key stands for ownership and possession. Read this. It is powerful, people. When Jesus Christ opens a door, he has supreme authority to do so. Amen. Some believe the door is speaking about admissions to local synagogue. No. No, that's not true. Jesus having power of the Jews and preventing persecution. Well, Isaiah 22, 2 is an interesting verse in conjunction with the message of the Church of Philadelphia. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. He shall open and no man shut. Make no mistakes, people. What this is talking about is the ultimate authority that Jesus Christ has, and we will reign and rule with him. The Actual open door in Revelation chapter 4, 1, make no mistake, is an actual type and shadow of the rapture. Um, delete that section here. Um, historical background, Philadelphia, here we go. The historical uh, theme is faithfulness, endurance, perseverance, and open doors. As Smyrna, now I want to talk about this. Another proof that the historical evidence is there. Just as Jesus spoke about the fake Jews, the Jews who say they're Jews but are not, guess what? That happened in Smyrna. It also happened in Philadelphia. The Jews at this time were in a major uprising. They were the opponents of the church, and they were more, they were worse than the Roman authorities. Regarding Revelation 
three nine, the problem with the Jews, Philadelphia uh, has problems. And in Josephus, his book twenty of reference uh, E, look at this. But see, Josephus looks at it from the Jewish perspective, where the Philadelphians against the Jews raised up upon uh, the death of King Agrippa, uh, which we've related the foregoing book. Claudius Caesar sent Caius, uh, I'm sorry, Cassius Longinus as successor to Marcus. Da da da, out of regard to the memory of King Agrippa, and then it goes on and on and on here. But look at how even in historical, we see the Jews and the Philadelphians having a major problem there. So enough on that. Now, I want to talk about the Church of Laodicea here. The words that I can say about Laodicea is the church of false doctrine. In my study link, what is doctrine? learning the teaching of the word of God. That's Jesus Christ teaching us his word is what doctrine is. And that's built on the King James Bible. You can read all about the history of how the Laodicean church was formed, the historical background. It's the, known for its lukewarmness, self-sufficiency. His spiritual team is repent and dependence on God. Come out from among them. Get out. Now, do you know that throughout the churches in each era and time, God always found his remnant to come out from them, come out from them. The same thing with Laodicea. Do you know that I came out of the Laodicean church? Sure did. I say it many times in my studies. I was a NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. I was in Dominion Theology. I was a Jewish Christian national. Well, I worship national Israel. That's God's chosen people. No, na national Israel is not God's chosen people. They are the evil tenants taking care of the land people. I used to be a Christian Zionist, hardcore people. It's wrong. It's pagan. It's, uh, it's a false teaching. All I came out of that. I came out of Pentecostal stuff. I was in that 50 years of playing church, people. But I came out because of the Trinity. I, I never believed. I, I, I was like, this doesn't make sense. This is crazy. Ever since I was a, 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 a young teenager, I said, this does not make sense. How could we have three gods but really one? And then later they said, well, he's not really three gods. That's Catholic. He's really three persons. But I'm like, wait a minute. The Catholic Trinity, what do you mean? It doesn't say, I know the Catholics believe in the Trinity, but it says the Trinity, uh, as you call it, doctrine, says there's three gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then, or persons, Jesus is the second person, demeaning him, this little diaper-wearing, cow-towing boy. It's so pagan. I came out of that. Why? Because I know my Savior. Jesus will never let his children in false doctrine people. He'll bring them out, come out from that, Church of Laodicea. Now, in the doctrine study, I want to open this up. Uh, I think it's time to go through this. Well, let me let me open this doctrine study later. I got ahead of myself. Let's read the link, please. Now, as I said, the Laodiceans, they're lukewarm. That's when Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold. I spew, spew you out of my mouth. They have to repent. Come out of that church, people. But you don't know you're in there because you're blind to it. But if you really belong to the Spirit of Christ, read Romans chapter 8, verse 9. If the Spirit of Christ truly dwells in you, which is the Spirit of truth in John chapter 16, 13, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus told the Pharisees, the reason you don't know the truth, because the truth is not in you. Please beg, ask the Lord, show me, Lord. After the Pope was removed from power in 1798, this person, yeah, yeah, what Laodicea really means is the power of the laity. And this is, fits the description for two reasons this person writes. Because once the Antichrist Pope was removed from power in 1798, the Babylonian-based papal church was brought back to life by the Jesuits. 
when in 1929 Mussolini signed a treaty with the Roman Catholic Church, giving them political power once again. Today, the papal church clergy organizational structure controls 1.2 billion members, which is one-sixth of the entire world population. Now, you're probably thinking, hey, you said that Thyatira was the Catholic Church, but that what I'm trying to tell you, that's when it came into being during that age. And it thrived, and, and, and it now I'm going to tell you something. The Catholic Church thrived, and then it started to languish, and then it got its power restored, like I told you. Now, the Catholic Church, the Vatican, has totally infiltrated, totally, completely infiltrated the Protestant churches of today. As I told you, the Church of Philadelphia, and as I pointed out, the, the, the uh, Puritans, the Separatists, they saw that. The Pilgrims, they got out of that. The Catholic Church didn't go away. Satan is still working mightily through that beast system there. This person says that the false prophet will be the Jesuit superior general. Uh, I don't go with that. It might be, but I'm just trying to show you in the notes here how the, the Laodicean Church, the Catholic Church is still very much involved. It's now completely controls it. Now, we're told... And uh, over and over again, come out from among them. Now, uh, what I write here is after 20 centuries, the devil realized that neither by persecution, by civil authorities of Rome, nor by all the efforts of the Catholic Church to stop the printing of the Bible in English, murdering William Tyndale, uh, the foiled gunpowder plot to kill King James, to stop the King James Bible translation didn't work. Finally, we see in the Laodicean church age that, guess what? The Vatican finally found the ultimate way to bring people under bondage of false doctrine through the corruption of God's word. How did that happen? This came about in 1880s, right, by two apostate closet Jesuits at Cambridge University, Brooke Westcott, Anthony Hort. They were commissioned by the Vatican to write a new translation from the uh, corrupted Sinaiticus and the uh, Codex uh, Vaticanus. These manuscripts were corrupt, and, and I'll let you read it for yourself, but basically they got them in Alexandria, and one of them, I think it was the, uh, the Van Van Vaticanus, was literally in a trash can. This produced the begin of the flood of perverted Bibles. Today, we have our NIV, ESV, NASB. And even now, later in the Laodicean church as it progresses, we have Bibles that are beyond belief. We got It's gotten worse. We now have the feminine God. There's all the masculine pronouns are deleted. The alphabet soup Bibles. That one called the message. It's a story, but it's not even close to word of God. But and, and then read this brief excerpt about Westcott and Hort. Not only did they were they very evil scholars there at Cambridge, they didn't even believe in God. They published the new Greek critical text. It literally changed the Bible and the, that the majority of the Christians used. Read this, please. I won't take the time to read this. The video is getting quite long here. But read all of this about Horton Westcott. This is the Laodicean church people. They denied the reality of heaven. They denied biblical salvation. They denied the actually heretical, it's blasphemous, either divinity of Christ and on and on and on. Read about, I have another chapter 8 that the chick.com people put together on West Cotton Hort. What happened here? Now I'm going to go back to doctrine. The Laodicean church, it lives in false doctrine. It uses a perverted Bible. They follow the Trinity. Oh, I got the whole list here. Now, now I'm just now open the doctrine study. Please read what is doctrine. I spent a lot of a diligent time working on this. 
doctrine is not what this Robert Bowman defines as uh, accepted truth here. Teaching intended to be the accepted truth, believed as truth, based on perverted Bible translations. This is the carnal mind, the vain philosophy conjured up in religion. This is the Laodicean church. They believe in perverted Bibles. They think there's nothing wrong with the NIV or whatever. One of the most abused, misused words in the Laodicean church is the word doctrine. Man's philosophy teaches that there's a list of doctrines and only a few are called essential and Trinity is one of them. The divinity of Jesus Christ, even though the Trinity demotes Jesus as a second person, they, it, it, it's astounding. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of predestination, the doctrine of soteriology, which is salvation, now, along with these essential doctrines, they call it the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, I'm not kidding you. Now, below here, I have a whole listing of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans is what's running the Laodicean church. Nico literally means to rule. Laodicans are the people. Putting them in bondage with men, we're telling them they got to pay their tithes putting them in bondage with perverted Bible translations, workspace salvation. Uh, let me go through the list here. I don't wanna, uh, but read this study, please. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, as I said, Trinity. They teach the Laodicean church. Here's my top 20. All Bible translations are God's word, life from hell. Uh, salvation, they, they, they teach that salvation is grace. And they always add something on carefully. They teach, uh, they don't teach eternal security. Uh, the Laodicean church always has people in bondage. You can lose your salvation if truly saved. They teach that the church is not the bride of Christ, that the church is not in prophecy, that all religions are acceptable. They teach that God, oh, it doesn't matter if you sin, God still loves you forever. You can just basically sin your code by grace, hyper grace. Then you get the hyper dispensationalists. I already talked about them. The minion theology where we got to build God's kingdom now. Uh, more like the Laodiceans teachers, no separation of dispensations. It's all they, the kingdom gospel. Yeah, that means if you, uh, uh, if you commit a sin there in the Beatitudes, Matthew 7, you better cut your hand off. But don't take that literally. Listen, they put allegory everywhere and put the kingdom gospel as a functional part of the gospel of grace. It's all in their studies. They teach that the church is replaced. Some teach the church is replaced to Israel. That's replacement theology. Other teaches other teachers teach there's no one in Israel. The church is church. Israel's is Israel. When that's a lie, we all come in to be one. Read my studies. One in Israel, the bride, the wife. <clears throat> Laodicean church today, many of them teach there's no hell. No, they teach there's no pre-tribulation rapture. They teach end-time prophecy does not belong to the church. Teach people how to attend church, pay tithes, plus much, much more. Read my links here, please. And uh, let's see. Read what Nicolaitan is and the, uh, the whole thing behind the doctrine of Balaam, please. That's enough on that. Okay, I'm going to close out the study. Know when you see the book of Revelation, it's very real. It's very important for our time. Those churches are churches. We are the, if you're saved, you're the church of Philadelphia. If you think you're saved in plain church, you're in the church of Laodicea. Even so, come out from among them. Lord, I submit this work for your glory. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Maranatha.